joining us once again for yet an extremely topical and extremely timely AMET webinar. Yesterday, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, told the UN Security Council that Iran has marked the latest rounds of talks in Vienna with new nuclear provocations and, quote, vague, unrealistic, maximalist, and unconstructive positions on both nuclear and sanctions issues. Yet, she also said that, quote, we're convinced that if Iran approaches talks in Vienna with urgency and good faith, we can reach and implement an understanding, a mutual return. We cannot, however, allow Iran to accelerate its nuclear program and slow walk its nuclear diplomacy. And the E3 nations of Great Britain, France, and Germany have expressed equally um, disenchanted views of the Iranian position. As we discussed last week, the Iranian chief negotiator, al Bagari Khani, recently said, quote, the very term nuclear neg negotiations, excuse me, is rife with error. He said that the goal of negotiations is simply, quote, to remove the unlawful and unhuman sanctions. Those of you who are loyal listeners to our Met weekly webinars know that Iran has at least 17 to 25 kilograms of highly enriched uranium at the 60% level, which is a quick and easy glide to the 90% level necessary for a nuclear bomb. As Iranian-backed Hezbollah has developed an arsenal to Israel's north with approximately 150,000 missiles, at least 100 of which have been converted into precision guided munitions that can easily dismantle critical parts of Israel's infrastructure. In fact, just this morning, the Tehran Times published a map of Israel pinpointing dozens of spots depicting exactly where in Israel Iran is threatening to strike if Israel decides it must conduct a military strike against Iran with the foreboding headline, just one wrong move. The article ended with a 2013 quote by Iranian Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei warning that Iran would quote, destroy Tel Aviv and Haifa if Israel quote, makes a mistake and conducts a military strike. As Brigadier General Yessi Kuprovasser had stated at an, on an met webinar last week, um, in his many recent meetings on Capitol Hill in recent months, he was left with a distinct impression um, from both sides of the aisle that the thought of military action on the part of the United States was simply off the table and that this is simply Israel's problem and perhaps that of the Gulf states to deal with. Yet many people are unaware that this is not just about Israel and the Gulf states, but that Shia Islam is a messianic religion with hegemonic ambitions, and that Iran does have a Hezbollah presence in Latin America with an easy striking distance of the continental United States. Is Iran planning on replicating its famous land bridge stretching from Tehran to Baghdad to Damascus to Beirut? and uh, the Mediterranean just under our noses, right here in the Western Hemisphere. That is why we're profoundly honored to have with us today, Emmanuel Atalengi. Emmanuel is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, a wonderful think tank here in Washington, which we often collaborate with, where he researches sanctions evasion and illicit finance networks linked to Iran and Hezbollah, with special focus on Latin America. Before joining FDD in March 2010, he headed the American Jewish Committee's Transatlantic Institute in Brussels and taught Israel studies at Oxford University. He holds a PhD in political theory from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and an undergraduate degree from the University of Bologna in Italy. And he has testified several times on Capitol Hill. So Emmanuel, we are honored to have you. Tell us what is going on under our noses in Latin America. So first of all, good afternoon and thank you so much for, for inviting me. It's always uh, great to be on this platform and uh, I am a great fan. I have also attended your events uh, as, a, as, a, as a participant uh, in, 
in the past have seen uh, always uh, great speakers and insights. So it's, it's a great honor. Uh, let me dive uh, right into our topic of today um, by sharing my screen uh, and we can look at what Iran and Hezbollah are doing uh, in Latin America. Are you all seeing uh, my presentation? Great. So what Iran and Hezbollah are doing in Latin America, actually, when you move from the public debate to the policy circles, is, is fairly uh, well known. And every year, at least once a year, uh, the uh, senior commander of Southcom, uh, when he appears before Congress, um, rings the alarm bell, uh, letting, letting Congress and indeed the public know that we do have a significant threat at our doorstep. Now, the quote you see in front of you comes from the latest uh, posture statement by uh, Admiral Fowler, who is the commander of Southcom, where he indicated that uh, Hezbollah uh, not only is historically responsible for three very well-known attacks, successful, uh, tragically successful attacks in the region, um, but um, also more recently was involved in at least three planned operations that were disrupted. And just as a reminder, uh, the three attacks he's referring to were the ones against the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires in 92, one against the um, Jewish cultural center, the AMIA, also in Buenos Aires in 1994. Uh, the first uh, had 29 dead, the second 85 dead, hundreds of, of wounded, and then the downing of a small um, commercial airliner flying between Panama City uh, and uh, the coastal city of Colón in Panama, which also uh, killed all passengers on board uh, in 1994. And for many years, this was, was kind of a mystery, but it, uh, there is conclusive evidence that this uh, this was a terror attack attributed to, to Hezbollah. And when he talks about the uh, failed plots, he's referring to two known plots, uh, one in Peru, where a Hezbollah external security operation agent Mohammed Amadar was arrested in October 2014 in the early stages of planning uh, an attack on uh, public uh, places uh, in, in Lima. And more recently, the arrest of Samir al Debek uh, in the United States, uh, again, a Hezbollah external security operation agent who had been scouting the Panama Canal um, during multiple visits down in Panama uh, with the intention of facilitating an attack either uh, on the canal itself, on, on its infrastructure, or more likely on a merchant vessel, possibly an Israeli vessel or a US vessel. Either way, had the attack been carried out, that would have been, um, you know, disastrous, uh, not just for the loss of life, but also the impact uh, uh, on the global economy. The third attack, uh, it's a yet undisclosed plot that failed. Uh, but since Admiral Fowler spoke in March before Congress, uh, we know of an additional uh, failed terror plot in Colombia this time uh, arranged, uh, orchestrated by an Iranian contractor of the Ministry of Intelligence, identified as Rahmat Asadi. He was in Dubai in jail. He uh, recruited two Colombians uh, he shared a cell with. Once the Colombians were released, they, they came back to Colombia and they um, started scouting and stalking and following um, Israeli businessmen and it appears also U.S. diplomats in Bogota uh, in order to plan uh, uh, an assassination uh, of, of these targets. And, and this is a plot that was recently revealed. So we're not talking about, you know, things mm -hmm. far back in history. We're talking about very recent uh, attempts. And we know from the arrest of Samar uh, 
in, in the US in 2017, uh, alongside another ESO agent, Ali Kurani, and then a third one uh, in 2019, Alexei Saab, that Hezbollah indeed has a presence in the United States. They have sleeper agents, um, and all of them have come to the United States legally as immigrants. They have acquired US citizenship and have then um, been activated once they were uh, full-fledged US citizens, uh, clearly because uh, the organizational values and views uh, an agent with a US passport uh, uh, as, as a very, very useful asset. So this is, this is a clear threat and it's not, it's not just uh, presence or soft power, uh, propaganda or diplomatic relations. There is a lot more to it and, and it is a clear and present danger. Um, to uh, Israelis, uh, Jewish institutions and Americans, both abroad and potentially also here. Um, and just to sort of bring it into the broader context of, of Iran as well, this is what Admiral Fowler said the year before. So this is an ongoing problem that's been uh, clearly uh, addressed extensively and highlighted to our policymakers for years, as you can see. Um, the infrastructure that Iran has established in the area over the years includes uh, not just uh, the kind of soft power uh, of religious institutions, cultural centers, uh, local Shia communities linked to Iran and Hezbollah, but also presence potentially of, of a weapons cache uh, and certainly of fundraising and the increasing convergence of these illicit uh, finance terror networks uh, with organized crime. And of course, this very extensive infrastructure established over the past four decades uh, can be activated uh, for all sorts of purposes, including collecting evidence as the previous examples clearly indicate, uh, or also provide the infrastructural and logistical support for agents dispatched for the very purpose of, of carrying out tax, as it was the case with the Amya bombing, where the logistical infrastructure came from the Lebanese community in the tri-border area of Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. And this is what uh, Admiral Fowler said about Iran again uh, in, uh, in March 2021. So here, 2021. So here clearly we have um, a very senior public official from the US military in charge of overseeing uh, US interests and in national security in the Western Hemisphere, regularly raising uh, the alarm about uh, Iranian penetration, as well as penetration in the region, and the fact that uh, their presence leveraging the local diaspora um, is very consequential in a negative way for our own security. So just to briefly uh, go over the many things that uh, these two nemesis are involved with, uh, let, let me just uh, go over some of the points that I'd like to try and, and illustrate through some brief examples in my presentation. First of all, um, we do have terror finance networks uh, in the region uh, run by Hezbollah. They interact with organized crime syndicates. They provide services to these syndicates to launder proceeds from illicit activities such as the sale of drugs. Um, they also provide logistical uh, services. They help move the illicit goods. Um, over the years, Hezbollah networks have moved from just being money launderers uh, into actually being active traders of the merchandise. Um, they use part of their revenues to grease the wheels of corruption in the region that is needed to protect their operations. And of course, none of these services um, is given for free. Um, it is given for a commission, usually a hefty one, which is the main source of independent funding that Hezbollah gets uh, to sustain uh, the terror group's uh, uh, annual operational budget back in Lebanon and in the rest of the Middle East. Um, and so it's very important to understand uh, that uh, these, the presence of both Hezbollah and Iran 
serve a multiplicity of nefarious purposes and that the presence of large diaspora communities is one of the things that both Hezbollah and Iran leverage uh, in order to sustain these operations and to maintain support throughout time. This is not something that um, has uh, happened overnight. It is a long-term investment that continues generation after generation. Uh, now, Iran, of course, is Hezbollah's patron. Uh, the two are combined and very much integrated in the way they operate regionally. Um, but Iran, in addition to supporting or directing Hezbollah in its own activities, um, as a sovereign state with diplomatic relations uh, and as a revolutionary uh, state with an ideology it wishes to export, is also heavily invested in the region to establish a large network of soft power institutions, um, often disguised as benign uh, uh, religious uh, institutions such as mosques or cultural centers um, that, are, that are the basis for operatives uh, that are tasked with spreading propaganda, um, indoctrinating and recruiting supporters, establishing connections with local political actors, local political movements, uh, and of course, governments. And they are a cover for a variety of nefarious activities, including logistical support uh, networks to plan terror attacks, money laundering networks, uh, cover for the dispatching of, of agents and so on. And so just to summarize, this is the threat on our doorstep. First of all, the influence networks, uh, which are often overlooked um, because again, we look at mosques and cultural centers uh, with the mindset of a country that makes freedom of religion uh, and freedom of speech, uh, central tenets of our values, but these are institutions accompanied oftentimes by media outlets, by publications um, that serve the purpose of spreading a radical ideology that aims to reach and co-opt decision makers, opinion formers, and also generally speaking members of the public, some of whom are recruited and indoctrinated to the point of actually seeking actively to convert them into Shia Islam and turn them into um, local native agents uh, of the regime. So that's the first big threat. The second, of course, is that these networks couple as uh, support networks engage in all sorts of illicit activities, such as fundraising for Hezbollah and Iran, illicit finance and logistical support, and part of the illicit finance, as I mentioned, uh, intersects with criminal activities. Now, what is important to understand is that these structures are highly integrated and they frequently overlap joining forces where needed. In other words, the mosque is not just a place for indoctrination and for maintaining the loyalty of the local diaspora community. It is also a place that is used as a conveyor belt for agents it is a place uh, that serves the purpose of recruiting uh, and keeping in line local businesses. Um, it serves a variety of purposes and both Hezbollah and Iran through their respective institutions cooperate and uh, share resources uh, and activate one another when it's needed. So let me go into examples, uh, starting with Iran's propaganda in Latin America. The photo you see is from a public demonstration in Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, during the 2006 war um, between Israel and Hezbollah. It was a demonstration supporting Hezbollah. Hezbollah remains uh, 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 not outlawed in Brazil. It's not designated as a terrorist organization. And so support is very uh, open. Uh, what's important about this photograph is that you do see a number of clerics uh, uh, at the forefront of the, of the march uh, in the central uh, avenue of Sao Paulo, a bit like uh, you know, Fifth Avenue in New York, 
some of them are Iranian, some of them are Lebanese, and some of them are Brazilian converts to Shia Islam who studied in Iran uh, under the supervision of regime schools that are designed to train foreign converts. One of them, uh, a gentleman named Rodrigo Jalul, uh, um, after becoming a cleric, and this is a model that Iran has perfected over the decades, has returned to his own native Brazil, has established a religious center in Sao Paulo, which he heads, and he uses his status and the center and the resources of the center to engage in propaganda activities for the regime. He launched the um, Al-Quds Day March, something that the Iranians do the world over. Uh, it's a day of propaganda against Israel, but he launched it specifically in Sao Paulo. And since 2017, he's in charge every, every year of making sure that this event uh, takes place. Uh, these are photos of publications in Spanish. Uh, two are translations of the Quran, but the third one is actually a journal for children um, in Spanish. Both are publications made uh, in Spanish by a uh, foundation or an institute called Islam Oriente that operates out of Iran. It is in that specific seminar designed to reach out to foreign converts. And these literature was found in the homes of drug traffickers in the tri-border area. The reason why the Lebanese drug traffickers had literature in Spanish is because they married local um, uh, Latin, uh, Spanish speaking women and in the process converted the wives and made sure that the children uh, would follow uh, in the same path. So that literature serves the purpose of anchoring new uh, converts uh, to, to the cause. And the, the literature is quite extensive. It goes from the very highbrow metaphysical uh, theological publications all the way down, as you see, uh, the literature for children, for adolescents, um, in a variety of formats. Uh, the cultural centers are also engaged in very uh, uh, strong uh, radical propaganda. It's not just about promoting you know, Persian food, art, and history, but as you can see from these two examples from uh, the Facebook page of the Caracas, Venezuela-based uh, Iranian center, uh, there is a strong focus on making Iran the champion of the most radical version of the Palestinian narrative. And this is something, a phenomenon that spans the entire region. Um, there is a lot of outreach. This is, uh, um, a, these are uh, screenshots of um, ads for a one day study uh, event conference that took place in Sao Paulo. Some of the people you see here are from the Iranian propaganda operation, including some converts. Some of them are uh, affiliated with Hezbollah uh, and the local Lebanese community. They include actually one US citizen uh, who has become a recruit uh, for the Iranian propaganda operation. And these are events that are designed to communicate to the broader public in these countries Shia Islam is tolerant, open-minded, respectful, uh, moderate. We're not like the Sunni Salafi who blow themselves up. It is an outreach uh, type of activity that seeks to gain sympathy for Iran and Hezbollah in the process. Uh, and of course, uh, it is not all benign. This is one example of a publication put out by Islam Oriente, the uh, institute that was mentioned before in, in Iran. And I should add the, the head of this institute is a sheikh named Mohsen Rabbani. He was, has been uh, implicated in the terror attack on the AMIA in Buenos Aires. There is a red notice by Interpol against him. He has escaped uh, capture, eluded capture, returned to Iran uh, in the mid nineties. And since then, he is in charge uh, of and supervises the entire propaganda activity in Hispanic 
languages, so Spanish and, and Portuguese. This is the translation of a famous or infamous uh, treatise by a French uh, pseudo scholar uh, who's a Holocaust denier. Um, and you can access this easily online and download it in its Spanish translation, provided the uh, courtesy of the Iranian regime. Here's another publication produced uh, by a Colombian based uh, uh, publishing house. It came out at the end of 2020 um, in order to commemorate one year uh, since the death of the, uh, the uh, Quds Force General Qasem Soleimani. And it is an not just interesting because you can buy it on Kindle, uh, Amazon for a uh, dollar and six cents, um, but also because it's specifically designed for a target audience of adolescents, depicting uh, Qasem Soleimani as kind of a, of a mentor role model hero uh, to you know, 12 to 16 year old readers. Uh, and last but not least, this is an example from Peru uh, where you can see that in addition to these types of propaganda activities, the Iranians are also trying to reach out to um, um, radical local political movement. In this case, this is a separatist Peruvian movement that uh, has uh, sort of uh, tried to leverage uh, uh, Inca nativist uh, identity. Um, they are you know, advocating for the freedom of the south of Peru. They're very radical. Uh, and clearly they're getting some funding from Iran. This is a photograph from their office in Lima. And I'm sure you can, you've already all noticed that despite the fact that this is a Peruvian Inca nativist movement, they have a portrait of Ali Khamenei in their office, a clear indication of, of that connection. Now, this was an outlier of a, of a political movement, but since the election uh, of a very left-wing um, president in Peru uh, earlier this year, they have become more prominent. One of their main um, uh, figures uh, established actually a political party called El Partido de Dios, the party of God, which is of course Hezbollah. He's a convert to Islam through Iran, uh, an agent of the Iranian regime and has become a proxy uh, for the current president. So this is one of the long games that Iran plays across the region, become a supporter, a financial supporter, a donor, uh, and an ally of radical political movements when these movements get closer to power, so does Iran. And let me now move to Hezbollah because of course Iran is a state actor. Hezbollah uh, is not. Uh, Iran and its agents are Persian speakers, but most of the Shia of Latin America are descendants uh, of Syro-Lebanese communities, uh, or they themselves are migrants from Lebanon in the 1980s. Uh, loosely connected to Hezbollah or to Amal, the other Shia movement. And what Hezbollah has done uh, ever since uh, it was established, um, it's been to invest in the reproduction in miniature of its uh, Dawa system that has kept the community loyal in South Lebanon. By this I mean not just send agents, but ensure that mosques are built, schools are built, youth movements are established and that the people in charge of dispensing the education of the sermons, of the, the fundraising for charity purposes, the clerics, the scouts leaders are all agents of Hezbollah so that the message that these institutions send to the communities and the social, cultural, religious, moral values taught to the new generations are in lockstep with the vision of Hezbollah. And I'm gonna give you a few examples. Uh, here's a photograph from the commemoration of a slain uh, Hezbollah militiaman who died in Syria in March 2014. The man leading the eulogy at the local mosque in Curitiba, uh, state of Paraná in Brazil, is his uncle. And Hassan Ataya, the uncle, is not just clearly a Hezbollah supporter, but he is a scouts leader for the local scouts branch, which is called actually the Brazilian Lebanese Scouts Movement, but based on the research done 
by me and my colleagues at FTD, we are very confident that the Scouts movement is actually affiliated with the Al Mahdi Scouts of Hezbollah in Lebanon. And I want to show you further evidence of that. This is actually another ceremony remembering another Scouts leader who died in the war against Israel in 2006. The ceremony is from 2011 at the Shia Mosque in the tri border area. Uh, and here is, uh, you know, some evidence from, from the Scouts movement. Uh, I was telling you that our analysis suggests they're affiliated with the Almaty Scouts. And here are some examples. First, uh, the Ashur ceremony in 2014, again, remembering martyrs linked to the local families that belong to the mosque. 2016, this is a photograph from Sao Paulo, Brazil. You can see that the kids are all wearing t-shirts with official Ashura logos produced by the Hezbollah Public Relations Department. And in one case, actually, one of the kids is wearing a t-shirt with the Hezbollah logo itself. And this is a photograph uh, from 2017 from the mosque, again, in the tri-border area. These are the celebrations for May 25th, which is when Israel withdrew from uh, Lebanon. And it is called uh, uh, the Day of Resistance and Liberty. Resistance in Arabic, al mukawama is the code word for Hezbollah. And the children wearing the high uniform are bearing the slogan of the Mahdi Scouts. Mahdi is the secret to our victories. And this photograph from December 2017, taken from the Facebook account of the Scouts, shows you know, a, a sort of an outing of the scouts and the parents and, and, and leaders where two young scouts are carrying an improvised Israeli flag before they burn it uh, in the bonfire. I'm not sure that the World Scouts movement would prove <laughs> of an affiliated scouts movement doing this type of action, but this is proof of the kind of activity that Hezbollah and Iran engage in, which is geared toward brainwashing indoctrinating, radicalizing these new generations. Um, and that helps then recruit uh, young members um, for a variety of activities. And despite the fact that oftentimes when we confront some of these activities, including illicit finance networks, trade-based money laundering, uh, fundraising, there is always a question of whether the people involved are part of Hezbollah or whether these are just loose network of sympathizers. When you look at Hezbollah, it's clear that this is a very hierarchically structured, centralized chain of command um, that goes all the way down to, uh, to these communities. And there are a variety of formal and informal instruments that these communities use to move money back to Hezbollah in order to support its uh, terrorist activities in the Middle East and elsewhere. Um, and I just want to give you again a couple of examples to show you how everything comes together uh, neatly in one, uh, in one uh, uh, coherent uh, structure. Now, first of all, this is the chart uh, of Hezbollah. You don't need to look at all of the details, just focus on, on two things. One is that the Executive Council um, is responsible for the financial activities of Hezbollah, mainly through what is called Al-Qarq al-Hassan. It's a, it's a financial institution of Hezbollah that Treasury sanctioned in 2007. Uh, but also the Executive Council is connected through the um, regional offices and the Foreign Relations Department to the, what is called the Jihad Council, which is really in charge of the external security organization of, of Hezbollah. And here are some of the individuals that are connected to the Foreign Relations Department, one of whom, um, Bilal Wehbi in Latin America, was sanctioned by Treasury in 2010. Despite the sanctions, you can see him in a photograph from 2018 in the company of the then governor of the state of Sao Paulo. But I want to focus on someone else, namely the sheikh uh, that headed the mosque in the Ivory Coast in Africa, just to give you a sense of how these networks are not just local, they're global and highly integrated. Now look at this. This is the designation by Treasury of Sheikh Kobaisi in the Ivory Coast from 2009. 
Sheikh Obais was basically the unofficial ambassador of Hezbollah in the Ivory Coast and was in charge of organizing visits, fundraising, and even recruiting uh, fighters uh, for Hezbollah. Once Treasury designated him, the Ivorians expelled him from the country. He had to go back to Lebanon. And as you can imagine, Hezbollah immediately replaced him with somebody named Sheikh Baleb Kujok, who took over his job. And you can see that Sheikh Kujok is connected to one of the leading Hezbollah sheikhs in the tri-border area of Foshtu Iwasu, and that this gentleman, Ghassan Abdallah, is also the head of the Iranian Islamic Center in Santiago de Chile. So from Ivory Coast, through a mutual social media connection to the tri-border area, center for money laundering, all the way to the other side of Latin America in Chile, uh, in an institution designed to advance Iran's revolutionary uh, propaganda. Now, Kujok is not just a sheikh and he's not just running a Hezbollah mosque and institution. He is also a holder of an account at al Qard al Hassan, the unofficial bank of Hezbollah, which means that he's a money collector for Hezbollah. Now, he's in the Ivory Coast. And he's not the only one doing this. Another, and, and here you see him connected to the head of foreign relations for Hezbollah in Europe. But he's not the only one. Here's another one, Radwan Balbaki, a businessman in Senegal. He has four dollar accounts. And based on his social media, he has some interesting connection. You can see this guy, Hassan Jabai there. I'm just gonna hold off for a second about him to show you that Albaki is also connected to Raed Berro, head of the foreign relations unit in Africa for Hezbollah. So let's be clear, these are not just businessmen doing business and sometimes donating money out of their own goodwill. They are part of an integrated fundraising structure with a chain of command where the Hezbollah senior officials uh, are in charge. But let me get back to Hezbollah. Hassan Jabai, because Hassan Jabai is actually in Brazil, not in Senegal. And he's a family member of two people implicated in a money laundering case that was prosecuted in Miami in 2018. If you look at his social media, the connections with Hezbollah jump out at you very obviously. I, you know, in the interest of time, I'm not going to list them all, but I just want you to focus on the third name on the list from the top, Hussein Khalil Dia. His brother, Hassan, used to be the Paraguayan ambassador to Lebanon. And when he was ambassador to Lebanon, he arranged the visit of the then president of the Paraguayan parliament to Lebanon. That gentleman, the president of parliament back then, is now the vice president of Paraguay. And because he introduced him to Hezbollah party members, he lost his job in 2016 as an ambassador. He lost his job, but not his influence. Now, here is the connection. Hussein, Hassan Jabai is a business partner of Hussein Khalil Dia. Khalil Dia has numerous companies in Brazil and in Paraguay. And in both cases, Hassan Jabai is a business partner. And the reason for that probably is that Hussein Khalil's dear mother is a Jabai. So these are probably cousins. One of the clear elements in these networks is that you have the party, you have the ideology, you have the clerics, you have the command structure, but you also have the family. And as an Italian, I can tell you, Mediterranean families are not small, they're large. And when they get involved in illicit activities, the bloodline and those Ties of blood are extremely important. They're just not random. Um, he also intersects with, with uh, Nazia Yu, but more importantly, on the one side of this connection, you have the businessmen with the accounts in the Hezbollah financial institution as a collector. On the other side, you have a variety of businesses likely involved in money laundering, but also critical political influence and connection. Here you see the two, Khalil Dia's brother, 
had an official visit at the presidential palace in Paraguay in October 2018, taking a photograph with the current president of Paraguay, Marito Alto. And here, a photograph of both of them during their visit in Lebanon in 2015 with Hugo Velasquez, the gentleman with the pink eye at the center of the photograph, who is now the vice president of Paraguay. And how did that connection happen? Because previously, Mr. Khalil Dia was the advisor of Hugo Velasquez, current president of Paraguay. Now the Diaz are also connected to the religious nomenclature. One of their brothers is a sheikh in Lebanon who recently visited Paraguay. So here you see in just one example how these connections span the globe, how business people involved in questionable commercial activities are linked through family ties and friendships to key uh, Hezbollah officials, as well as money collectors for Hezbollah. And this complex network that cross jurisdictions and span the globe are used to move the funds from point A to point B and sustain Hezbollah. So to conclude, here you have a number of examples showing how Iran and Hezbollah are engaged in a variety of activities that are highly integrated, that are part of a very well thought through, through sophisticated structure that involves the diaspora communities and that is engaged in planning of terror attacks, recruitment and indoctrination, radicalization of communities, money laundering and fundraising for the organizations. And all this is happening on our doorstep. So without further ado, I hope I covered the ground. I thank you for your time and I look forward right. to your and questions. You did. You covered the ground magnificently. Um, and we wish there weren't so much ground to cover. Um, you did mention also that there were um, Hezbollah operations in North America. Could you describe some of those a bit? Yes, indeed. So many of you, first of all, may remember that in 2011, the, um, there was a, a terror plot exposed and disrupted in Washington, D.C. The idea was to murder the then ambassador of Saudi Arabia at Cafe Milano, a popular upscale Italian restaurant in Georgetown. And the plot uh, was ordered by the COPS force of the IRGC. Um, and it went through a relative of the officer in charge, who was an Iranian American uh, working at a used car sales business in Texas. Now this seems far-fetched, but you may also recall that at the time in 2011, uh, Hezbollah was running a very complex, multi-continent wide money laundering operation that was involving taking money from Mexican and Colombian cartels, laundering through businesses in West Africa that were buying used cars in the United States. And then the money was going through money exchange houses and banks in Lebanon. So the fact that it is far-fetched doesn't make it less likely because precisely this type of business is what the Iranians and, and Hezbollah were using in, in, Latin, in, in the United States. Now, why was this uh, plot uh, exposed? Again, because of the type of ties that Hezbollah has. When this man was tasked, he sought to procure explosives through contacts inside the Zeta cartels, which are business partners of Hezbollah. Now, as Locke had it, the person he contacted eventually uh, spilled some of the beans to somebody who was an undercover informant for the EA. And that's how we found out about the plot and that's how the plot was disrupted. But so that's one example. I mentioned three agents that have been arrested in the United States. 
Ali Kurani, Samir el Debek, and Alexei Saab, all three of them follow a very clear pattern. They come to the United States to study or to seek employment. They go through the process of legal immigration. So they get here with a visa, they marry someone maybe and get green carded and then become citizens, or they spend a long enough time to become citizens. Once they're citizens, they become activated. In all three cases, we know that prior to obtaining citizenship, over several summers, these three individuals traveled back to Lebanon and were trained by Hezbollah in a variety of military skills, including explosives. The, the guy uh, implicated in the Panama Canal uh, plot in particular, was trained in managing uh, explosive that involved ammonium nitrate, something I'm sure by now everyone here in this audience is, is familiar with. It's the material that blew up the Beirut port. It is something that is commercially available very easily. Probably all of you have at least a little bit of it in your own freezers because it is the kind of uh, substance in, uh, that is in those first aid kits, uh, you know, the, what we call ice packs. That's the kind of material you need to make these improvised bombs. And so one of the things that Hezbollah does is it uses front companies to patiently and slowly buy first aid kits uh, from pharmaceutical uh, import expert companies, accumulates them over the years. Uh, and then, you know, when they have enough of it, they go and carry out attacks. We know this because um, one such uh, agent was arrested with eight tons of ammonium nitrate in Cyprus in 2015. A raid by MI5 in Britain found three tons in a warehouse in London in October 2015. Uh, a, a botched attack in Thailand involved uh, ammonium nitrate. In the case of Samir al Debek, what we do know is that he was planning the same thing. And what it is not publicly known is that the supplier of that ammonium nitrate was a member of a very well-known, very well-established diaspora Lebanese community in Latin America that is very much involved in money laundering and whose father and uncle are on the sanctions list of treasury as Hezbollah financiers. So here you have Hezbollah financiers, clerics, agents, companies, all coming together for a specific purpose, organizing a terror attack, but also engaged on a daily basis on all the other activities I described. Right. I have many, many more questions, um, but I don't want to monopolize your time because I know that many people in our audience are eager to ask questions. So now it's my um, profound honor to turn the podium over to Hussein Abubakar Mansour, my wonderful colleague and director of Amet's program for emerging democratic voices out of the Middle East. Hussein. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, and uh, thank you very much for all our audiences who tuned in and, and sent us all the questions that we received. And um, uh, thank you, Manuel, for such a, an il truly illuminating presentation. Uh, we've received a lot of comments um, uh, just uh, thanking you for, for all of this. I think I am personally startled, uh, along with many in our audiences, and just in the depth and the width of, of all of these networks. And I'm sure I wouldn't be speaking for myself when I say truly thank you and how grateful we, we are for you doing all of these works in order to track and map um, all of these networks. Uh, we received, Of course. And we've received, there is a question that we've received, as you may imagine, from a lot of people in our audiences. Uh, basically, what about the U.S. government? To what extent is the U.S. government aware, the administration, the Congress, our security agencies are aware of, of all of these networks? And, and to your knowledge, what are they doing about it? So, you know, I think that those posture statements speak for themselves. So the government is aware. Um, the question is how seriously they treat 
these types of threats and how uh, actively engaged they are in countering those threats. And I think that whereas there, there is awareness, uh, the assessment of the nature of the threat and the kind of actions uh, leave much to be desired, especially, I think, when it comes to the soft power uh, side of the Iranian activities, because as I, I hope I, I convincingly showed, these structures are not just there to, you know, tend to the spiritual needs of, of, uh, of, of uh, the faithful. They're there to recruit, to indoctrinate, uh, to spread influence, and also potentially to aid uh, in, the, uh, in, a, in a host of nefarious uh, and illicit uh, activities. Uh, just to give you an example, one of the typical ways Iran manages to send agents to Latin America is by dispatching clerics who go to Latin America as meat inspectors. Latin America, especially the Southern Cone, exports an enormous amount of meat around the world. As you know, the, the Muslim world is a 2 billion consumer market for halal meat. The Iranians send uh, meat inspectors. These are not just meat inspectors. And when they get sent, they get, you know, they come, they come to families, they establish their own little mosque. They, they, they are there to start building networks. It is the way the Iranians started their operation uh, in Argentina, for example, uh, mm -hmm. Rabbani went there as a cleric for the local mosque and as a meat inspector in 1982 when he first moved to Buenos Aires. So this is something to watch, and I don't think it is being watched uh, significantly. The other thing is, and that, that is a question that I, I want you all to ponder, it's not just the U.S. government. 90% of the evidence that I've shown you, and these are just samples, comes from social media platforms, which are US corporate entities. How is it possible that designated officials or Hezbollah senior officials, members of Hezbollah financial institutions under US sanctions, potential terrorists are actually on Facebook and Instagram being able to conduct their encrypted communication activities with their networks without any intervention uh, from or censorship. That is a huge problem that I think is still not being fully understood, let alone addressed. Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, we received a question actually about the scouts. Um, the, yes. the behavior of the scouts, was this data reported to the overseeing international organization at all? So I have flagged it to governments, to interlocutors in, in agencies. It's been published uh, in, on a variety of platforms. And frankly, it is a known and widespread issue uh, because this is not just in Latin America. I mentioned the Al Ghadir Mosque in uh, the Ivory Coast. Al Ghadir uh, in, in Abidjan has its own scout movement, which is an exact replica of what you've seen in Sao Paulo, Curitiba, and Foster Iguazu. Um, there are examples, I suspect, in North America too. Mm. Um, it would be desirable, I think, to reach out to the world uh, scouts movement and raise, a, uh, raise, uh, raise the issue there because clearly these organizations are formally disjointed from al marti scouts, but their symbols, their instructors, and the values that they uh, propound are perfectly aligned. And I don't think that they, uh, they uh, overlap very well with the values I understood to be part of the worldwide scouts movement. Um, you mentioned, you talked about the illicit financial activities, you talked about the financial support, support that, that, that you get out of this. We received a few questions asking, all right, other than the money and having the soft power and, and, and influence, is this a part of an existing grand strategy of Iran or Hezbollah 
uh, it's what is their long-term goal? Is it just truly just the spreading of their revolutionary Islam and, and domination? Do they have a clear strategy uh, and, and goal to do this? Yes, so that's a great question. So Iran is a revolutionary power and Hezbollah is an extension of its ideology. As a revolutionary power, they don't believe that their ideology should stay within the borders of the society uh, of, of Iran itself. And they do not believe that um, it is limited as, a, as an ideology just for Shia Muslims. They believe it has to be exported to the world. They identified Latin America very early on as a fertile ground for expansion, not because they have such great, large um, Shia communities waiting to be indoctrinated, but because Latin America is stark. I mean, remember, Iran, uh, the Islamic Revolution you know, came at the height of the Cold War. Latin America was and remains to some extent a fertile ground for anti-Americanism, anti-imperialism. Now we have the Bolivarians and the Castro Chavistas. Back then we had regimes aligned or movements aligned to the Soviet Union. So Iran saw this as an opportunity. And what's interesting is that they emphasize and tailor their message to appeal to these audiences. Sometimes, you know, um, emphasizing the anti-imperialist message and playing down the Islamic one. Uh, but the purpose is, is to build uh, and, and, and spread uh, support. Now, what they do is, it's, it's very interesting, their recruitment model is very similar to the you know, communist party model under the Soviet Union. They go for the elites, they go for the vanguard, they're extremely careful at who they recruit, they take a long time before they accept people in. Um, and then they use their agents as incubators and amplifiers for their message. And yes, they play the long game. And I want to give you an example. The chief, one of the two chief missionary figures of the Iranian operation in Latin America is somebody who speaks beautiful Spanish, a uh, young cleric who wrote a book um, in 2017, 2018, which he describes, he, it, the book is called something like the Christian conquest of Latin America. So it's a history of how Christianity conquered Latin America. And he says, this is a book that I wrote for Shia missionaries to Latin America to understand the local culture, and more importantly, to understand that Christianity became the dominant religion of Latin America in less than a century under the pressure of violence and conquest. So the, the underlying message is we can do it too, even in a shorter amount of time, out of the power of persuasion and appeal. So yes, it is a long game. And as much as you and I may think this is bizarre, they believe that they can gain enough clout and support among key figures in the societies there that it will play to their advantage. And if you look at Venezuela, to some extent, I think they're right. No, I, I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't personally think it's bizarre. You know, I grew up I grew up in Egypt and the Middle East and I understand the mentality. I understand it's possible. And I feel so sad that there are so many people who grew up with a liberal mindset don't understand that this can work. Religious belief is real. People can convert. Entire societies can change their outlook and their faith. And uh, this is a real danger. We don't have a lot of time, but I'm gonna, I have to get another question in. We received a lot of questions. I'm, I'm sorry to all our audiences that we're not gonna to get to their questions. Um, what about the local government? So like right now we talked about this plan, there is conversion, there's influence. We're talking about these networks of power and influence and wealth. It is unimaginable that this doesn't worry that we're already established structure of power and wealth, uh, whether secular in the local government or let's say even Catholic, the Catholic church there. Like, is there any sort of native resistance to this? Right, so that it's a great question. Um, let's, let's try to break it down. First of all, you have governments like Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, uh, Bolivia to some extent, Peru potentially now, and if other countries go, and Argentina, 
uh, to a lesser extent. And if other countries go the same way in the, in the wave of elections that we have in the next two years, could be broader, that have identified Iran as an ally. And so in exchange for whatever Iran provides them, Venezuela now, of course, is sanction evasion, gasoline, um, money, weapons, training. They give Iran whatever Iran needs. And that's you know, the ideal situation. So Venezuela has thousands of Venezuelans converted to Shia Islam now. It has mosques, it has cultural centers. Iran has managed to establish and broadcast, as you know, a Spanish language TV channel, uh, and it uses Venezuela's uh, Telesur Bolivarian TV infrastructure, some of their journalists to, to do that. So that's one. The second uh, situation is of countries like Brazil, like Chile, uh, who for a variety of purposes, you know, they're not aligned with Iran, they're more aligned with the United States, but A, have a significant, um, either Shia, Muslim, uh, Lebanese expatriate community, or in the case of Chile, a radicalized Palestinian community. And so for political reasons, they don't want to antagonize these communities and they choose to ignore uh, or to address specific local security threats, but not to call Hezbollah a terrorist organization and not to break uh, ties with Iran or to contain them. And the third uh, situation, which is widespread, is that you have um, a lot of politicians who like money and uh, they get bought uh, by these networks. So I gave you the example of Paraguay where both the current president and vice president, and I should add, vice president is the favorite who become president in 2023. They are in the pay of Hezbollah, even as they present themselves as allies of the United States. So you find different attitudes and different motivations, sometimes ideological, sometimes just opportunist. But the result is the same. There is a lot of laissez-faire. There is the assumption that the Middle East is a problem that is remote. We don't want to start treating them as terrorists and antagonize them because we don't want to bring the problem here. And as a result, these networks thrive. The only argument I found persuasive enough with local politicians over the past six years of this project is to highlight how these networks are highly integrated with organized crime. Because organized crime is increasingly the biggest threat of survival for these societies. And so that may provide an opening, but we're not there yet. Wonderful. Okay. Um, we're just about at that witching hour. Emmanuel, I cannot thank you enough for the profundity of your years and years of accumulated wisdom um, about this, this growing um, menace um, to, to all of civilization. Um, and um, I, I really would like to direct people to read your work. A lot of it could be found at the Foundation for Defense of Democracy's website. Um, and I, I would like um, to um, ask all of our um, listeners to please consider supporting the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, which we collaborate with very strongly. It's an amazing organization. And of course, to support the work of Amet that works very, very hard to bring this into everybody's living rooms, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of time, energy, and effort to, um, to try to enlighten um, the um, members of Congress and their staffers that we meet with almost on a daily basis about these issues and um, the public. And it is our, our deep philosophy that um, a well-educated public um, will trickle up eventually to our policymakers. Um, so please give both to FDD and to AMET. Um, um, the FDD website is fdd.org, right? And um, ours is ametonline.org. And again, it is really um, an honor and a privilege to um, have you on and to to have you as a friend. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you so much. Extraordinary work, just extraordinary. Thank you. Bye thank now. you. Bye now.